Dave, welcome back to another segment in our Wood Technology Series. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. You touched on a little bit earlier in one of the segments of, uh, you know, the original mills and some of the quartering systems and so forth. But I got to thinking the other day, you know, you're teaching students and have been for years. How do you talk about lumber sizing and that age old uh -huh. question, you know, when they come to you and say, you know, why is a two by four not really <laughs> two inches by four inches? Well, you know, for my cabinet makers and my boat builders, of course, we're mostly shopping rough if we can, in part because a lot of times we can turn it on edge and resaw it and turn it into smaller boards and, and actually net a little bit more. But a carpenter can't do that, okay? They need to be able to buy the materials and go put them in. And so they also need things where the spacing is the same. All of our construction materials mm -hmm. are based on a certain distance. So for instance, a four by eight sheet of plywood, we space for residential, most of our vertical members at 16 inches because three times 16 is 48. Okay. So this, this nominal portion of things is really important. And we'll go back to uh, the old honest to God two by four. Um, again, with the mills and everything, it could be a little bigger, a little smaller, but now we've got something that's graded and it's gotta be a certain size. Yeah. So what happens is you season the wood at the mill and everything, you put it in a kiln and actually dried it down to a particular moisture content. And they'll see a lot of, of uh, labels on here. It could be KD 19 to 19%, MC 15, um, you know, it or a KD 12%. And they're actually drying the wood as well. So you're gonna get some shrinkage. Yeah. And afterwards, when it's all milled, what you'll find is you're going to lose a certain amount. Yeah. So if we we're talking either thickness or width, under two inches, we're going to lose a quarter of an inch. So I had something that was four quarter, four divided by four is one, yeah. and we call it a one by. But we're going to lose in the surfacing, surfacing in all four size, we're going to lose a quarter of an inch. You need to get back down to something like that. But you're going to start yeah. with something quarter inch thick or rough. Yep. Okay. Quarter inch thick or rough, and we'll call that okay. four quarter. Okay. If we had five quarter, now five quarter trim is really common for us. Um, if I have a corner board in a house and I'm dying siding into that corner board, a nominal five a quarter. A nominal, nominal five, five quarter, quarter right, and that's the problem the nominal versus actual, and that's what drives everyone nuts. Um, but the five quarter, when it's reduced, is down to one inch solid. I think you might have a chunk of it over there. Though. Yep. Yeah. So that, that five quarter trim, and here's the frustrating part. <laughs> in our new fly ash composites, in our PVC, yeah. they'll call it five quarter. And that never saw a song <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but this is what they call five quarter. Yeah. And because we're always riffing on what wood was called out. That's right. So the one buys, the two buys. So from basically from two to six, we're gonna lose a half inch in thickness or width. And after six, we lose three quarters of an inch. So this drives my students nuts. It'll yeah. say a two by 12. Well, it's one and a half by 11. And, no, it's one and a half by 11 and a quarter. Yeah. All right. And, and you just learn to know where those breaks are. Yeah. But again, nominal versus actual are two different things. Well, it, Mike Dunn, God bless him, he's famous for talking about unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And what I remember over the years, we've been buying our uh, pressure treated lumber from Exterior Wood down in Washougal for four decades probably. Well, they go out and they just buy lumber in the mills like we do. And <laughs> you know, so they're trying to make two by eight pressure treated all purpose construction lumber for deck framing. Well, they might have four or five mills they source from that they trust. Well, if they're not all trying, making it at seven and a quarter, and we've yeah. seen that over the years, yeah. and you don't hear about it until our, one of our deck builders gets it out of the job. And sure enough, there's you know, a mix, the units were from different mills. And all of a sudden they're saying, hey, you know, that's an eighth difference or what? So that consistency is really, really important. And a lot of it's played into how we engineer our structures now. When you think about something like Simpson Strong Tie, they are like the eight million pound gorilla when it comes to a connector. Well, if the connector doesn't fit because the wood's too thin or too thick, yeah. again, so those connectors are every bit, and especially yeah. in, in the Northwest, I come from back East and back there seismic is not an issue. Yeah. We don't strap our homes down to our foundation. Yeah. Here we strap every floor yeah. all the way up. Yeah. And we use a lot of connectors. So if the wood isn't sized appropriately, you're in trouble. Yeah, the router comes out. Well, Dave, you and I have been doing this stuff for a long time now. So we're really comfortable with 
sizing and the nomenclature in, in, in our industry, but obviously a lot of people aren't. I remember reading a couple of years ago down in California, a group of people got together and decided that the, the signage in the box stores on the lumber racks was misleading to the mm-hmm. general public. You know, it says two by four. Well, you and I know for the most part, it says two by four from the mill to the wholesaler, all the way along the line, every purchase order, every invoice, the whole thing. Um, but long story short, there's actually a, a lawsuit down there and Lowe's had to cough up $1.6 million and change all the signage in a hundred stores in uh, California to comply. If you know, and what I tell my students, if you know where the brakes are, this makes sense. Yeah. And also when you think about it, this is a surfacing thing. So basically, as you look at this board, uh, this piece of lumber, I should say, um, this is actually surfaced on all four sides. So for someone that is taking raw wood and has, or rough wood and has the actual ability with the joiner, the planer, and the table saw, they can go ahead and surface it S4S themselves. Yeah. But a carpenter doesn't have that time and they don't have those tools on right. site. So they need S4S That's and right. with these edges on site. They've got a production schedule. They're trying to get a house built in yep. 90, 90 to 120 days if they can. You know. I thought it was interesting you talking about the drying. I think you're right. In the in the early days, you know, they start with that two inch rough, and to get it dried and surfaced and have yield this, it took another half inch. Mm-hmm. I think uh, these days probably they can get by with a, a little less of a blank to start with, potentially, and get a higher yield. Yeah. Well, listening to you talk, it got me thinking. We've been uh, and a lot of other people in the local market been selling uh, a five quarter, what they call a five quarter nominal net inch uh, by four, net three and a half, eased edge, uh, tight knot cedar decking. Well, that can be milled, as you know, in many ways. It could be green, it could be dry, and then there's different ways to dry it, drying processes. So we were really, uh, this. yeah, you can even feel it. So the mill we buy from, because a lot of people say, well, you know, why would the price vary on something that seems like Mm -hmm. apples to apples? Mm -hmm. Well, our supplier, they would actually, they'd go, they'd cut it, then they'd dry it. They'd trim it for defects that happen in the drying process, right? Yep. They'd clean yep. up ends or whatever, surface it down a little bit. And then to boot, they'd wax an end yep. to keep it from checking. So I just thought that was really kind of a good tie-in to some of your drying. You know, it, when you look at the real expensive stuff, the high price spread, okay, a piece of ebony, all right? And we're talking at a hundred bucks a board foot. It's actually dipped in wax, the entire piece of wood. Seriously. And the reason is to try to limit the amount of moisture that goes in and out. Um, But during the drying process, you lose a lot. So what it started with way back when, before they had kilns, is you would sticker the wood. So you would put little pieces of wood between all of the, if you will, a whole lift. And these stickers would then give it a space to dry. Just air dry it. Air dry. Right. And that air drying, what they've told me is it takes about a year per inch. You know, so you think about it, a four by four, four year, no, there's no way we can wait yeah. that long. So we push it by putting in a drying kiln. Um, but it's it's a difficult process because mm-hmm. if you dry it too quickly, you're gonna get checks and splits on the ends right. and maybe case harden it. Right. If you dry it too slowly, you're out of a job. Right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. you really have to make sure that you've got it dialed in. And then the wood will surprise you sometimes. Sometimes um, yeah, everything's going really well and other times it's not. So that whole process of drying it to something that the end user would have, um, that's, that is a very, uh, it's not It's not just cut and dried scientific. It's something where a really good operator knows how to operate that kiln. And you notice on a lot of our boards, you'll see a paint and that's kind of a waxy paint. And it'll come from the mill that way. And what it's trying to do is it's limiting the water going in and out of this board. And this is what a lot of people don't see. When you think about it, because of the way these straws, if you will, if you want to consider wood as a bundle of straws are going, most of the moisture movement is out of the ends or the yeah. end grain. And this is why we have cut end solution and everything mm-hmm. to try to limit that even as we're applying it. I tell my students a lot of times if you've got bar drafters coming onto a house, you know, just bring up some waterproof glue and wipe the ends. And all you're doing is sealing it. Okay, you're not gluing the ends together, but you're sealing it so there'll be a little bit less moisture movement. I love that. That's amazing best practice that does not get done nearly enough. Well, it mm-hmm. gets in the way of our speed. And yeah. um, I, I tend to think that we're, 
um, we, we're going for a quality build, yeah. and there are certain things that will help with that. Yeah. In our climate zone. Especially in our climate oh, zone. Oh my goodness, yeah. yeah. Once again, Dave, this has been a really interesting and awesome stuff. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the Thanks, next Jim. episode. Thanks.